Hello again, and welcome to Interview with DJ Nocturna. My guest today is uh, a producer, composer, and founder of the Toronto, London-based experimental group called the Flowers of Hell. I got J Greg Jarvis on the show. Hello. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for finally, finally, we are connected. You know, I know you've been to Hawaii. You were here. You were here for a few days, and we, we couldn't connect, but um, I'm glad you came down. You kind of experienced a little bit of the islands. That was your first time, right, to Hawaii? Yeah, that was my first time. And it was neat to pass through, having been through a lot of Polynesia before getting there. I'd been to Easter Island. I'd been to, into New Zealand. I'd been to Fiji. And then to uh, Kiribati, to Christmas Island. And so it was interesting seeing that much of Polynesia and then arriving at Hawaii and just seeing the similarities and the differences of it. Yeah, and you were here on just vacation? Yep, just vacationing through, really just traveling just passing through yeah oh yeah and i was in tahiti and bora bora there as well so again just seeing all the differences of yeah i, I know you for, been... for france to have an island out there and what's like for america to have an island out there fiji's relationship to the british new zealand's oh, yeah, relationship. Yeah. Well, well, you... it's interesting all that side of things yeah you know, I mean... i'd actually i've been in the south pacific um not just on holiday i was trying to reach jarvis island with my last name being jarvis oh yeah and, it's it's really in the middle of nowhere and 379 kilometers from Christmas Island. And when I got to Christmas Island, there was no boat that was seaworthy enough to do the deep ocean to get me across to it. And they did have one plane on Christmas Island, but been broken for years and no one knew how to fix it or how to fly oh, really? it. So, oh, oh, I've never been to Christmas Island. <laughs> yeah. That's, so, that's amazing. Yeah, no one lives there and no one can get there. It's uh, it's oh, visited yeah. maybe twice a year by science expeditions. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I, I know you've been traveling to Japan. I know we were trying to do the interview at some places you were you were at, but it was kind of hard because of the time difference and all that or something like that, right? I think we were well, trying Yeah, to... and then some of the Wi-Fi. I was in Mongolia for a oh, while. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mongolia? Yeah, I was actually oh. surprised in the Gobi Desert in the yurts. You could actually sometimes get decent internet through your cell phone since it's a nomadic land and so many of them live nomadic the government's put in place great cell phone internet service yeah i always wanted to go to mongolia i want to go there one day highly recommended Genghis now, honestly it's one of the most spectacular places on earth and it's just got its own truly distinct local culture to it oh yeah yeah i'm gonna take the train the orient express i think it goes through there but oh, the uh, trans the trans siberian express route through there yeah oh yeah yeah well, you know, thank you for doing this interview with me. Um, you know, I'm I'm really loving the music you're you're producing. You know, particularly, um, I've been playing them, especially the olds. You know, the tribute album you did. Yes, this is, thank oh, you. This is great. And your 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 singers and performers. I was thinking, let's start out with a little bit about um about what your production is about. You know, because I know you've been around since 2005, right? The Fox yep. of Hell, and you reach i mean you you've connected with all these amazing people like lou reed right yeah, yeah, lou, yeah. no honestly it's been legend. <laughs> you know i mean we're a very small band but we've gone to work and hang out with all our heroes through doing what we do so that's uh, really been the biggest reward of doing oh your band is pretty pretty large actually i saw all those like ins instruments yeah, I mean, well, it's it's really it is an orchestra for what we do on record. Though when we're playing live, often we're just a six piece doing more of the rock songs. Oh. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, every now and then we get to do a proper orchestral show with timpanis and gongs and pianos, as well as all the rock instruments. And you know, when we get to do those 12, 14 piece shows, that's really something to get to pull off. Oh yeah, yeah. So t t tell me a little bit about yourself, because I know you founded. Um, the the you know your project called the flowers of hell tell us how that came about and a little bit about your musical background well i've always worked in the music business and the music i made myself was just not so non-commercial i never looked at pursuing it to try to earn a living from um but then you know i sent some demos to one of my music here heroes sonic boom from spaceman 3 and I'd heard back from him the next day. I was living in, in London at the time and he was living just north of London. And so I just posted him some demos and I'd said that, hey, I was gonna be passing through his town and I had some good weed if he wanted to meet up. I got this <laughs> response right away going, I like the music and I'm out of weed. When can you come? 
<laughs> I went on up there, we hung out and we got along and he invited me on back a couple of times. And then um, he just really encouraged me to work on my music and uh, help me out with making our first record. Uh, that really just got the ball rolling for us. Because you're on you're your sixth studio album already. I know you had several different ones in the past, right? I mean, yeah. people want to check this out. You can go to Bandcamp, right? That's, that's a, you got your Bandcamp page there, and uh, this is your your sixth studio album, and I'm gonna have you pronounce that. Yeah, Kashakteran. Yeah. yeah, and and I know that that means seeking Nirvana through meditation to sound. Exactly, <laughs> especially when you're stoned. <laughs> it's an urban dictionary word. You know, I was just Googling, trying to find something that summed up the idea of stone meditation to music. And um, that's what came up. And it seems that some Ukrainians invented the word about 10 years ago. Oh, uh, you know, the interesting thing, right? I was just reading a little bit about you in your in your um, about page, which people can check out. It's called floresofhell.com. But I know you're a self-taught musician, and you have this rare neurological condition that's connected yes. to sound. Yes, synesthesia. So I see sound, and it's not that uncommon. One percent to four percent of people have synesthesia, and most common form of it is you're reading text that's printed black, but A has a color, the word has a color. That's the most common form. Other people see with synesthesia see the dates around them in a circle. Um, or days of the week give them a certain sense of color that's always consistent and always instant when they think of that day. And then some people see sound. And sometimes that's just cloudy forms of color based on the pitch of the song. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's what I have where I see abstract shapes based on what each instrument is actually doing in the composition. Oh, wow. So uh, have you had this since you were a child? Yeah, you're born with it. Mm. I mean, one of the theories is that we're all born fully synesthetic for our first six months. All our senses are fused together. And then in the first six months of an infant's life, the brain prunes off into the separate senses as most of us experience them. And in synesthetes, some things remain cross-connected. So how, how did you first notice that, that you have that, that condition? Synesthetes is the same journey. It's just part of life, but somehow it's never discussed. And then you hear about synesthesia, listening to something like this. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, wait, you mean not everyone sees the sound? For me, I was just marking a student's paper and they said some people see sounds and it's called synesthesia. I was just kind of, you mean not everybody sees the sound? And so it's more a revelation that others don't experience it because for us, it's, synesthetes is just our whole life going living that way it's just normal and it's much like your sense of smell you've probably smelt a lot of things today but you didn't pay attention to anything you smelt unless it was going past a pile of trash or sniffing the milk before putting in your coffee or tea or whatever and so it's the same with the synesthetic visions of sound they're always there but i'm not particularly paying attention to them unless i'm actually you know playing or composing or working on a mix and then they become much more part of my focus so you, you must be more connected to, to, to music than with this. I mean, it probably brings a, a full awareness. Oh, uh, definitely. And especially the composition and arrangement. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, because, you know, in something like a symphony orchestra, when I go to that, just being able to see Beethoven's architecture unfolding in front of me, I, it's, it's hard to understand why people go when they don't get to see that. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to listen to, but the sights of sounds, it's more beautiful than anything I've seen in any art gallery around the world. Yeah. So this album, which is a which is recorded via Space Age recording, right? Yeah. And it's mastered. And of course, you produced it, right? You produced this album. Yeah, during and, the uh, pandemic. Oh yeah. You want to tell us about how that came about? Well, it, it, Kashaktran is really our lockdown album. I didn't know I was going to make another album, but it was just during the pandemic. You know, I, I didn't want to make another album because I hated how isolated I ended up being for so long when doing that. Our symphony was six years of me being quite isolated working on it. And so when suddenly I was isolated, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I should do an album. And like most artists with nothing in, I couldn't necessarily write anything. 
but I had this 40 minute meditation piece I'd been developing before the pandemic. And so I dusted that off mm -hmm. and then just started adding on to it and had all my bandmates and, and friends from outside the band who were also locked down around the world, send in their layers to it that I'd edit through and build into the composition as uh -oh. it just evolved and evolved layering up. And while it started being rooted in kind of space guitar playing, by the end, it was very much rooted in the takes of the harp and the sitars and some of the horn sections as well. And then our, our opera soprano vocal, Danny Friesen, um, adding her bits to it. So it's like, so it's, it's good for meditation then. So it's kind of, and I could see that. Yeah. I know there's, there's a part one, part two, which is they're all the, the, the side A, I guess, or side B and side A, they're 20 minutes, about 20 minutes roughly. Right. And then. Exactly. And really it's one piece by split it in half, knowing they eventually will be on vinyl and split in half. And in the modern world, there's just something easier for people when it's two 20 minute tracks, as opposed to diving into 40 minutes. That's. Uh... And then, and then you have the other one, which is a third track, which is a shorter piece. And I play that in the, I feature that in the show. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And that was really just done as a single for radio shows and other things. And to give people an access point to. Yeah. The really beautiful. Who was the singer on? There's a female voc uh, voice in there. Yeah. So that's Danny Friesen. And uh, I met her in a local cafe here in Toronto about 10 years ago. And then I was working on my symphony at that point. She'd mentioned that she was an opera soprano and while I was working on my symphony, I thought I would finish mixing it while I was taking a cargo freighter across the Atlantic Ocean. I thought 11 days at sea, zero distractions. I don't even have to think about what I'm eating. I'm just eating what I'm served in the mess with the sailors. And so I thought I'd get the mixing done. But somewhere out in the Atlantic, I was working on it. I realized, no, it needs a voice. It needs a narrative holding it together. And so when I got back to Toronto, I went back to the cafe, tracked down Danny. And was like, okay, so can you improvise? She was like, I don't know. So she came over, we played, she could totally improvise. And so then I reworked my symphony around her voice. She joined the band and we've been making music together for the 10 years since. Wow. Yeah, it's quite lovely. Quite yeah, a lovely no, I, I really do. It is quite a voice that she's got. And, and here in Toronto, she's a professional opera singer with her own opera company that brings opera into the bars around Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this album came out in um in on May in May of this year, and and is, and is mastered by a Grammy recipient, Peter Peter Moore. You want to talk about that a little bit? I know he's yeah. Peter Moore lives up the street from me in Toronto, and he's oh. really one of my old time musical heroes. He did a a record years and years ago, and I guess eighty eight with a Toronto band, the Cowboy Junkies. That's just oh, yeah. the beautiful record ever, the Trey Session. And I'd always loved that record. And, you know, I was living abroad for years and years. But once I came back to Toronto, I was like, I should track down the guy who did the Trinity session. And I did. And we became friends. And we've worked on a lot of projects together over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So this album is out now. If people want to find it, it's on Bandcamp. And you're, you have a website. It's called flowersofhell.com, right? Exactly. And, and Kashak Duran's also on all the streaming services. Kashak Run. Yeah. Great title. I have, I have to I have to look at it really to just to make sure. I I know, it's a bit of a tough one. I'm like, should I use it? I'm like, it's the word that sums up what it is. Oh, no, yeah, it does. Yeah. Now, now that I now that I know what it means, I, it totally is. Yeah. It's sort of like it's, it's a good time. It's a good length for meditation, too. Well, yeah, and, and while I was working on it, Toronto was heavily locked down. For out of 18 months, there was 13 months where basically everything was shut and you had to stay home. And human contact was meant to be limited to those in your household, which for me is one. <laughs> and so, you know, you weren't, most things were closed and you weren't allowed to see people, but you were allowed to go out and get massages. And so since one of <laughs> the musicians on Kashakran has a day job as a masseuse, I'd go to her and I'd over microdose on mushrooms and get a massage while listening to the meditation piece in development. And between the synesthesia, the massage, the sounds, it was just incredible experience, especially in those bleak times. It was truly just getting to be transported into some other sort of realm for 40 minutes. Yeah, and that's exactly what, what he was. <laughs> that's great. So are you, so you live in Toronto, right? But you, you used to live in London. 
Right. Yeah. Well, currently, you're based now in Toronto. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did a decade in London, and that was enough, man. It's an awesome city for music, but it's a hard city to live in. So the 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 members of the because this is like you have an orchestra, right? Yes. Can you tell us about that? I know there's several several instrument players. I mean, various types of instruments I see there in the picture. Well, really, we started out as a six piece band in London, England in 2005, mm -hmm. where it was your basic rock instruments plus a trumpet and a and a viola. And then it just kind of expanded and expanded over the years. Suddenly, OK, now we've got saxophone as well. Now we've got timpanis. Now we've got gongs. Now we've got flutes. Now we've got clarinets. Now we've got double bass. And it just kind of grew as the different projects and the different things we were musically trying to do required different instruments to come on in. And then again on Kshatran, with that one, we augmented our regular players with a sitarist and with a harpist and, and a few other things like that. And you have another album that I really enjoy. Uh, this was released a few years earlier, 2012. It's called Olds. It's a tribute album, right, to some of the amazing artists. Yeah, it's a covers album. When I was 15, I had Susie and the Banshees covers album through the Looking Glass. And it was one of the first cassettes I bought when I was that age, checking out music. And uh -huh. over the next like decade and a half, I was like, oh, this is what they were covering, as I heard the originals over well, time. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. It really laid out for me at a young age a way to do a covers album of where you have your own sound and you apply it to the songs you love. And uh -huh. that's what the Banshees have done with that. And that's what I, I tried to do with our covers album was to take our kind of orchestral pop sound and apply it to some of my favorite songs. So I, I know you have a, there's a, you know, you have a connection with Lou Reed, right? I mean, he actually heard. Yeah, well, this was the amazing thing was that um, it, it, I, I met Laurie Anderson, Lou Reed's wife out at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics when I was studying there in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And I'd given her the Odes album just as I'd finished it. And she absolutely loved this thing we did on it where we married her song, Oh Superman, with the Velvet Underground song, uh -huh. Heroin. And we turned it into Oh Super Heroin. And so she really loved that. And so she took the album home and played it for her husband, Lou Reed, and he loved it too. So he kicked off what became his final radio show. He had a radio show on satellite radio and BBC six for a little while. Mm. And he kicked off what became the final episode playing three songs from our covers album in a row and just saying how much he really loved the album, which for me was the highest compliment oh. I could really have. I mean, it, it meant much more to us than a Grammy would mean. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. It says right here. So beautiful and great exquisite from Lou Reed. Yeah, and, and he went on and on, like like he went on for nearly ten minutes about the record. It was really just oh, like yeah. wow, that um, yeah. And and as a guy who's famous for hating most things, it was really really <laughs> even more of a compliment to have that from him. Yeah, and you he's also to be such a sonic perfectionist that when we were doing his own songs, it was you know if. I wouldn't have had the balls to give Laurie Anderson the full record. I'd have given her just the one track, but all I had with me in the moment I met her was the full thing. And that's why I gave her it. But, uh, you know, to give Lou Reed us covering Walk on the Wild Side and us doing Mr. Tambourine Man as the Velvet Underground and Nico might have made it sound. It was hugely, yeah, an intimidating thing to give and uh, a wonderful response to get to it. Yeah, and the 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 singer on some of these, can you talk talk about her a little bit? Is it the same person? Um, it, there's different singers on that record, you know, and uh, and actually the girl who sang "Calling Occupants of Interplanet Aircraft," she did an amazing job of singing. Yeah, she that. did. That's a and, and, and that's one of the songs that Lou Reed loved, but um, I I really respect her and that she's such a perfectionist. She's not satisfied with her vocal performance on it. And she she really did actually want that one to be on the record. And she was saying to me later after it had come out and after Lou Reed loved it, I'm going, look, see, I told you it's good. Look, Lou Reed loved it. I so respect her because to this day, she's like, I don't care if Lou Reed liked my performance on it. I don't. <laughs> you know, she doesn't I don't like it. Oh. But it is, that's what makes 
It's beautiful it's though. It's yeah, well, let her know it's like beautiful. Level of perfection where they're not satisfied even with a top level vocal performance they've done. And so I really respect that she's got that highest of standards for her voice. That's you know, there, there's a song here, but I can't remember what it is now. But it sounds like uh, it sounds like Nico singing. I can't remember. Oh what yeah, that's our Mr. Tambourine Man. And oh, yeah, okay. the idea of that was to do it as it because Bob Dylan. He gave Nico a song, I'll Keep It With Mine, in the same month that he wrote Mr. Tambourine Man. And so the idea was to imagine what would it be like if he'd given her Mr. Tambourine Man instead of mm -hmm. I'll Keep It With Mine, because they were briefly dating in Paris for, for a moment. And uh, yeah, so it was reimagining it as if Dylan had given it to Nico. Yeah, and of course, the Joy Division's classic is just beautiful, as always. It's one of my favorite tracks. Um, yeah, we weren't even going to do that. It was it was one of the last things we did. It was more just we had it up our sleeve and we're in the studio. So, OK, let's give it a go. And then it turned out to be, you know, a standout yeah. track on the record. Yeah, you know, I, I like listening to different different covers of a song because it just brings out a different feel to it, you know. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's better than the original, in my opinion. But, you know, I mean, it's just the way that it's done. Sometimes it's just beautiful. And like and like this album, it's called Odes. And people can find this also on the on your Bandcamp page, right? Yeah, and there's there's an LP of that around. And, oh, uh, yeah, I think that you can find it through Space Age Recordings Bandcamp or, or RollingHeads.co.co. I think it's available from there. Yeah. The so who does your album? Um, it's just beautiful artwork. Your your. I, I always do the art direction myself, and I find different people to collaborate with on each album cover. Yeah, they're really, I mean, this is this beautiful um, cover. It's just very um, colorful. And yeah, I'm looking at the the Odes album as well. The, yeah, the and that's come out great on vinyl where it's all a die cut sleeve where you're pulling the, the image out from inside of a frame. It's uh, it's truly come out great on LP. And yeah. and just before the pandemic, our last gig was actually playing uh, at the Tate Gallery in London. Um, they were putting what they put one of our album covers on the wall for our, our 2009 Come Heller High Water album. Uh, we'd adapted a work by the great uh, eight, 19th century British illustrator Aubrey Beardsley for that. And the Tate were putting on the largest Beardsley exhibition done since the 60s. And so it was a huge honor that in the final room they had six LPs on the wall and ours was one. And we we're right next to uh, the Beatles revolver and right next to mm. Procol Harum's debut that's got white a shade of pale on it. So it was truly just amazing to be included in that. And as a last performance before being locked down, it was such a great one to be frozen on for two and a half years playing the tape. So I want to talk about the, the name of your project, The Flowers of Health. T tell me how that came about. Well, in some ways, it's an, it's a is a common mistranslation of Baudelaire's Fleur de Mal and mm -hmm. you know Baudelaire being the great French poet and also Baudelaire had had a fascination with synesthesia at one point him and Rimbaud um and it's also to represent is this old ideal in the blues that you know the toil of the performer leads to the joy of the listener and so there's that sense with the flowers of hell there that yeah what we do it's not it is not fun making a record that takes six years to make, but the end result and the pleasure that brings into the world is worth that that toil and the journey you go through making these things. Very interesting. Yeah, I love Baudelaire. Yeah, well, well you know, gosh, I mean, big shout out to uh, Shameless Promotion PR. Always amazing artists um, and very unique ones indeed. Thank you so much for being on the show. You know, I'm looking forward to. I I know you're. You, are you guys traveling still? I know you're doing a little. No, bit. finally after a year, I'm now home. But um, you know, it was a great year where I, you know, I played Tokyo, I played in Oaxaca, I played a psych fest on the coast of Chile, played the Hundred Club in London. Um, but now we're working on potentially something in Los Angeles for the new year, and might be playing Oxford in the new year as well over in the UK. Oh, okay. So you're just taking a break now, a little bit, Maybe exactly. before, before you start your new project. <laughs> I'm sure you. Well, yeah, and, and you know, also, you know, because I've been so busy with Flowers of Hell stuff the last uh, two years or so, that I'm also taking a bit of a break now. And when I was when I was staying in Prague for a couple months last year, 
I got to be the guest guitarist in this legendary old Czech Velva Underground covers band, the Velva Underground revival band. And they'd started out under communism where you'd get locked up for playing that music. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, after the revolution, Lou Reed found them, loved the way they played the Velvet songs. And Lou Reed even played in the Velvet Underground cover band twice. And so having really enjoyed getting to do a festival set with them, I'm now going to do a few Velvet Underground covers gigs just while I'm around Toronto, just so I can do something for fun where I don't have to labor. To are there more? Are there are there more tracks uh, that you want to cover from the from the Velvet Underground? Uh, not for recording, but for live. They're all great. I mean, that was the thing was it was a three hour set I did with these guys in the Czech Republic and really just one of the most fun concerts I've ever played in my life. The songs, they're just really, really fun to play the Velvet songs live. Oh, yeah, definitely. One of my favorites for sure. Wow, well, gosh. Um, you know, I, I missed out on that record day on that record store day thing that where oh, the O's LP was on that was I wonder if they're still around. You, you think oh, they're still around. As I'm saying, from Space Age Recordings Bandcamp, uh, they're fully available there. Yeah, no, that's great. It's record record story day. I I like those vinyls. And that's an LP, right? Yeah. And that's definitely something I would I would pursue. <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I I love the old, the both of the album. That's why I wanted to do this interview with you. I just heard it. And I'm like, wow, this is a very interesting artist. Well, thank you. Oh, well, well, for me, it's interesting to do an interview in Hawaii. You know, <laughs> well, you've been nice there. You know, we, we try to reach out, but it was it's nice to see the deeper cultural side of Hawaii beyond hula girls. You know, it's uh, you know well, you, that you you play the ukulele, right? Well, yeah, I do, I do, especially when I need my life saved by it. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell us about that. I know you went to Papua New Guinea. Is that where it is? I read it somewhere. Yeah, I was in Papua New Guinea, and I was I, I'd been on tour at that point in the UK and was just trying to get into Papua. Ended up in West Papua, that's occupied by Indonesia, and just had a nasty run in with the rebel army there, who basically held me in a hotel and were interrogating me, thinking that I must be a spy of some sort. <laughs> and I was having to play the ukulele to prove, no, I'm just a musician. And the rebel army, the OPM, they've got a history of kidnapping and killing foreigners that I only found oh my out gosh. after the fact. That, um, so yeah. Oh, they, got, they, did you bring your ukulele with you at that time? Yeah. Oh. And, and the, you know, the thing was, was they decided that they were going to take me to their rainforest encampment. And so at that point I realized, okay, I'm being taken by the rebel army. And, you know, they were trying to say, hey, look, we're friends and we're going to protect you from the occupying Indonesian army. That's when I knew I was fucked. The rebel army offered me protection from the occupying army. But they <laughs> wanted to pretend we're friends so that, you know, it's much easier to walk a man out of a hotel. And uh, so I was like, all right, so if we're friends, can I go to my room, get a few things? They're like, yeah, sure. You know, and so I came back with the ukulele. They were still discussing things. At that point, I was just feeling my life was over. And I didn't know if they were actually going to take me to the rainforest and camp or just execute me in the street. So I just kind of started to play thinking I might never get to play again. Then I was just off in a trance playing. And I noticed one of the soldiers started nodding his head to the music and that pulled me out of my trance. So I was, oh crap, they're actually, he's listening. This is having some effect. And then, you know, I just really played a bit more. And then suddenly that soldier stood up. He yelled at all the other soldiers. And then suddenly they walked on out. And the hotel manager and the hotel chef came over, gave me this big group hug going, Mr. Greg, Mr. Greg, we did not think it would end this way. <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. That's amazing. See, see, see the beauty of the ukulele? Yeah, well, exactly. Wow. exactly. The magic. Yeah, that's a powerful, magical instrument, that. You know, and so to be honest, I, I re I've rarely picked it up since because I've got it, but it just kind of freaks me out how much I owe to that instrument and just how how much how you know, power there is in that instrument. I would love I would love to hear you play in in, in a ukulele in another album. You know, like just I think that would be a great song. I mean, to something mm -hmm. because yeah, it's well, just, yeah. yeah. I I just think I think I think it would be, and then you you can you can talk about that story. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and it's also it amazed me traveling around Polynesia you know I really got to hear that Polynesian sound that's you know a couple ukuleles of different sizes all playing together with the booming drum and mm -hmm. it reminds me so much of the Velvet Underground where yeah. it's just all about the floor tom going boom 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 and the plinky guitars over top and so I really love seeing that connection of 
the Polynesian thing and the primal velvets early stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, wow, you know the story that you just told me. It's just uh, so so amazing, you know. And uh, congratulations on on this on the on the latest album. And uh, and I'm gonna go look for that vinyl now on the record store. I'm looking it up right now. I I I gotta see where it is now. It's available on your site as well, right? I think so. You know, Bandcamp does this weird thing where you can post it on both. The the order will go through to Space Age Recordings over in the UK. They've got all the all the copies of it. Okay, I'll I'll go look for it. I'm sure I'll find it. All yeah. right. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Oh, thank you. No, it's a pleasure to get Probably. to do this. You know, thanks Probably. for being interested and thanks for listening to it and thanks for reading up on these things. Yeah, it's such an you're such an interesting character. So I, I hope you, you come back again to Hawaii, you know. And oh, I hope so too. Up. Yeah. I hope so too. Yeah. Okay. Well the flowers of hell, you the website is uh, flowersofhell.com and of course on Bandcamp page, just look for it. And you're also on Facebook and Instagram. And we'll we'll have this um and I'll I'll feature um I'll see if I could feature the longer version of this of the song and the on the Oh, that'd be great. Or you know, I I have been playing the some of the, the covers that you've been that you've been that you featured on the on the Olds album as well. That's awesome. I yeah. just love the idea that these things are getting heard in Hawaii. That's really great. <laughs> Well, they're, it's not just Hawaii; it's all over. Right, it's going yeah. out all around, yeah. Yeah, and you know, people can catch uh, can find it on modstabradio.com. and of course, this interview this interview will be on uh, interview with DJ Nocturna on on my YouTube channel, and uh, it's also on the podcast. On you can find it on Spotify and everything else out there. All right, well, thank you, thanks, Greg. Thanks all for right. your time. All right, thank you very much, and thank you for your time too. Okay, all right, thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.